Chemistry 121 students. Uh, my name is Tom Gill, and I'm going to be uh, talking about Experiment 10, uh, give you the pre-lab lecture for this, and then afterwards uh, we're going to go into the laboratory. Uh, so Experiment 10 is the colorimetric analysis of commercial aspirin. This is actually one of my favorite labs, and at the end of this talk I'll tell you, you know, one of the reasons why it's one of my favorite labs. So let's take a look at a bottle of aspirin. Um, so this is the aspirin we're actually going to test in today's experiment. And if you look at the aspirin, it says that it contains 325 milligrams of aspirin. Okay. So aspirin was originally a trade name by the Bayer, Bayer Company, um, but they've lost their trademark protection. So all sorts of companies can make um, this product and actually market it and sell it as aspirin. Okay. Now, um, aspirin itself, uh, the actual active ingredient in this is called acetyl salicylic acid. Okay, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, so I'm going to abbreviate it as ASA. Okay, now each aspirin tablet, in addition to containing the acetyl salicylic acid, actually contains some other inactive ingredients. And so these other inactive ingredients, you know, are for the stability of the product um, and to, you know, render it into a, a capsule form. You can't just compress everything and make a capsule out of it. And if we look at the label, the inactive ingredients include uh, cornstarch, uh, calcium phosphate dihydrate, uh, glycerol triacetate, hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose, and hell. Okay. So one of our aims for this experiment is to find out the percentage of the active ingredient, the acetyl salicylic acid, in a tablet of aspirin. Okay. Now, personally, I'm kind of a lazy guy, you know, sometimes. And so if I were to you know, faced with this challenge, I would probably just take one of these tablets that has 325 milligrams and weigh that capsule on the analytical balance. And then I take my mass uh, of the active ingredient over the mass of the tablet, multiply by 100%, I'd be done. Okay, I'd be out riding my bike, playing frisbee golf or whatever. Okay. But of course, I know from experience that general chemistry students like to do things a little bit harder way, a little more convoluted way. Okay. Um, and actually, this experiment is pretty fun, okay? Um, so I'm going to step you through the steps involved in, in doing this experiment. So the first thing we're going to do when we come into the laboratory is we're going to prepare a solution from our aspirin. So I'm going to grind up a few tablets, and then I'm going to weigh out a certain amount of aspirin, okay? Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that and add to it some sodium hydroxide and heat it. This is to hydrolyze off that ester group, okay? And it'll convert this carboxylic acid group uh, to an anion, right? And then I'm gonna treat that with iron chloride and I'm gonna make this complex, okay? I'm not gonna bother to pronounce this um, name here, uh, but this particular transition metal complex is actually colored purple. Um, so it has absorption in the visible spectrum, okay? Now, before we get into the actual details of the experiment, it kind of makes sense that the higher the concentration of something that's colored, you know, the more intense the color is going to be. So I've got a little um, demo here, um, and I've got 400 mils of distilled water in each of these beakers. And so to the bottle, or the beaker on the left, I'm going to add one drop of green food coloring. And to the one on the right, I'm going to add four drops of green food coloring. Okay, you can see them mixing. Uh, I'm going to stir each of these up. Okay. And what we can see is the more dilute one that I prepared with only one drop of food coloring has a lot less color, you know, than the one with four mils. Okay. So this part kind of makes sense, right? The more of the colored uh, solution, you know, the, you know, I'm sure the higher the concentration of the colored solution, um, the more intense, intense it is. Okay. Now we can't tell by our eyesight. I couldn't look at this and say, Hey, this is uh, four times as concentrated, but we're going to use an instrumental um, technique. Uh, for analyzing colored solutions of ASA um, and their, you know, iron complex that they form. And then we're going to compare that to our aspirin uh, to ultimately, you know, kind of get the 
calculation we need. So let me put this stuff to the side for a moment. Okay, so the technique that we're going to use um, to analyze our uh, aspirin sample is called visible spectrophotometry. And we're going to use an instrument called SPEC20, and I'll show you the picture of the instrument in a moment. Uh, but basically, uh, this is a simplified diagram, but essentially the way SPEC20 works is that we've got a light source and it's an incandescent light source, so it actually emits all wavelengths of light. And then we have a prism, or a grating, actually in our case will be a diffraction grating, that's going to be used to select the particular wavelength, okay? Now the aspirin that we're testing, okay, is a it's going to form a purple colored solution. And we're going to use 530 nanometers, which is actually green light, um, to detect, you know, the um, the presence of that aspirin. Now, this light then goes through the sample solution, which is in a cuvette in the lab. It'll look like a little test tube, okay? And then that light travels to a detector. So detectors are very good at detecting, you know, photons, okay? And out of that, we're going to get a digital readout uh, from our instrument, okay? So there's two common types of readouts that we're going to get. Um, one of them is percent transmittance, and the other is absorbance. And I'll talk about those in just a moment. Okay. So this is the picture of the SPEC20 um, that we're going to use in the lab. And we'll see that when I do the uh, demonstration for the experiment a little bit later. Okay. So let's kind of think about a couple things, right? Um, these are the common units of measure that we're going to get out of that SPEC20, uh, absorbance units and percent transmittance, right? So let's think of what that means. Let's suppose I've got a test tube here, okay, or my cuvette, which has my solution in it, right? And let's suppose that I've got a light source, and the light source lets 100 photons out, you know, towards this cuvette. And then I've got my detector here. And the detector senses 10 photons. Okay, so 10 photons make its way, make their way to the detector. So let's just assume, you know, the other 90 photons um, were absorbed by the solution. Okay. Now, if we think about the fraction that's transmitted, it's 10 out of 100 make it through. And I'm going to call that the transmittance. So the transmittance is equal to 0 0.10. Now, oftentimes we express transmittance as a percentage. So if I convert this to a percentage, um, that's going to be equal to uh, 10%. Okay. Now, let's suppose that this solution here was a one molar solution. And I'll just say of compound A. Okay, now let's make another solution, and this time I'm going to make a two molar solution of compound A. Okay, now the absorption of the light is additive. Okay, so if the one molar solution absorbed 90% of the light, okay, in other words, 100 photons came through and only 10 photons. I'm sorry, 100 photons came onto it and only 10 passed through it. By increasing the concentration to 2 molar, that additional 1 molar concentration is going to absorb 90% of the remaining photons. Okay? So this 2 molar concentration, um, when we look at the photons that make its way through, only one of the photons is going to pass through. Okay? So the transmittance of this is equal to 1 over 100, or 0 0.01. If I convert that to a percent transmittance, um, that's equal to 1% transmittance. Okay? Well, let's talk about the absorption unit. Okay? So absorbance 
is defined as the base 10 log of 1 over the transmittance. And that's the decimal equivalent of the transmittance, not the percentage. Okay. So let's calculate what the absorbances are of these two, you know, hypothetical solutions. Okay. So if I take the log 10 of 1 over 0.1, that's the same as the log 10 of 10, right? And so the base 10 of log of 10 is just 1. Okay. Let's say I take the log uh, base 10 of 1 over 0 0.01. That's the same as the log, you know, base 10 of 100. Okay. And that is equal to 2. Okay. So what we've seen here is that by doubling the concentration of the solution, the absorbance doubles, okay? So what we're going to do is we're gonna measure the absorbance as a function of concentration. And we should see a linear relationship, okay? And we're gonna make a plot, you know, plot this on a graph paper, and then we'll be able to use this data to correlate an absorbance of the sample that we're going to analyze and find out you know, what the concentration of uh, EASA is in our, in our aspirin. Okay, so to give you an example of how this is done, um, I've got uh, some pictures and some data uh, from a similar analysis that I've done with um, phosphate ions. Okay. So it turns out that phosphate ions are going to make a colored complex uh, with the molybdenum compound, and it's very sensitive for the phosphate ion detection. In fact, these solutions that I've prepared here are only in the part per million level. Okay, let's take a look at these um, four Erlenmeyer iron flasks. Uh, the first flask represents a blank. Okay, uh, the second flask represents this one part per million concentration. Uh, the third flask over here represents the two parts per million concentration. And um, this fourth flask here represents a three part per million concentration. Now you can see just by inspection that as the concentration goes up, um, the intensity of the color increases, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use uh, visible absorption, okay? So these compounds themselves are blue, okay? And that means that they're gonna absorb light, you know, at the range of orange to red. In fact, this 650 nanometers is right at the edge of, you know, uh, the red and orange portions of the visible spectrum. Okay, so this is the data we've obtained. Okay, so what we're gonna do with this data now is we're gonna prepare what we call a Beer's Law plot. We're gonna plot the absorbance on the y-axis uh, versus the sample concentration on the x-axis. Because usually we write the independent variable on the x-axis, and then we're going to write the dependent variable on the y-axis. You're also going to have to graph um, the data that we obtained in the lab a little bit later. Okay, so let's take a piece of graph paper. And let me see if I can get the numbers in there as well. Um, might not be able to fit all the numbers in. Uh, but what I like to do when I'm using a graph paper is I like to use as much of the paper as possible, okay? So what I did uh, was I counted the number of squares in the x-axis here, and I found that I've got 22 squares, okay? Now, um, so I've got 22 squares going from left to right. And coming in this direction, I have 17 squares, okay? Now, um, the concentrations range 0 to 3 ppm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose 7 squares to represent 1 part per million. So 2, 4, 7. So this is our 1 part per million. And we've got 0 here. Here's 2 parts per million. And then this is going to be 3 parts per million. And so I'm going to label my um, x-axis as the part per million uh, concentration of phosphate ion. Let me show you where I have that. And on my y-axis, I'm going to enter the absorbance values. OK, 
Okay, so when I counted the squares on the y-axis, it came out to 17 squares. And our range of data is from 0 to 7, 0.764. Um, so if I use 0 0.05 per square, um, you know, I'm going to use uh, most of those uh, squares. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll label um, every, let's say, 0.1 absorbance unit as two squares. Okay, and this is going to be absorbance at 650 nanometers. All right, so now what we have to do is we have to plot the points. Okay, so this is our data right here. Um, so we're going to start at the origin. And then um, the one ppm sample has an absorbance of uh, 2.76. Um, so 2.576 is right here. Um, the 2 ppm sample has an absorbance of about 0.53. So let's do that. And then the last one, um, the 3 ppm long sample has an absorbance of 0.764. So let's graph that point as well. Uh, so 764 would be right around here. Okay. And then what I like to do is I like to take a clear ruler and draw as straight a line as possible, either through all the points or as close to the points as possible. And you can see this is pretty close to linear, but not quite. Um, so let me just you know, represent the line like this. Okay, and there we have it. Now, the way we would normally analyze a sample is we would measure its absorbance, and let's say the absorbance was here, and then we would draw a line over to our Beer's Law plot and then drop a line uh, down to the x-axis uh, to figure out um, the part per million uh, calculation. Okay, In the lab, we're actually going to use um, a, a calculated um, uh, linear equation to do the, you know, the, the analysis. Okay. So... Um, before I get into the lab, okay, I do want to um, kind of point out a few things uh, with respect to the lab report and things that you'll be expected to do. Okay, um, so in the very first part of the lab, okay, we're going to run some calibration samples, right? And you're going to use some zero zero two eight zero molar ASA solutions to prepare three standards, all right? And the instructions for preparing the standards are probably going to be discussed in the lab, but they're also in your lab report. So you need to show your calculations, okay? So calculate the concentration for, you know, solutions A, B, and C, okay? Now, the mass of the aspirin, I'm going to, you know, just measure that on the balance, and you'll be able to uh, see that for yourself. The one thing about this experiment is that we're going to, instead of doing a graphical analysis, you're still going to have to do the graph and label it properly for your lab report. Uh, but when we do the computer analysis, uh, we're going to get an equation of this format, y equals mx plus b, okay? So... The computer is going to tell us the slope and the y-intercept. And you're going to use your data for absorbance um, to figure out, you know, what the concentration of your ASA sample is that you're analyzing. Okay. So the y-value um, is actually the absorbance value. And the x-value is your concentration. So after I run the calibration curve, I'm going to run uh, the absorbance of the sample, and I'll show it on the instrument, and you need to record that absorbance. Okay? And then what you're going to do is you're going to plug that into the y value of this equation and solve for x. 
Okay. Now, some of the calculations that we're going to do in this lab are basic dilutions. Okay. And so the dilution equation looks like this. The molarity, initial molarity times the initial volume is equal to the final molarity times the final volume. So you're going to have to use these calculations, you know, to find the concentration of our three standards, A, B, and C, okay? And then you're also going to have to do this particular um, dilution cal uh, calculation, I should say, to go from steps three to four in the tablet analysis, okay? And I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do it, but the one thing to remember is that, you know, we're going to be analyzing a solution from a 25 ml um, a flask, okay? And to prepare that solution, we started with a 250 ml flask and we diluted this, um, you know, like three mils of this. So when you do that calculation, you know, this is going to be more concentrated, all right? Now, if you get a result more than 100%, Okay, um, you've obviously done something wrong. And, you know, I'll tell you, aspirin is going to be mostly aspirin. You know, so if you get a really, really small result, then you've also done uh, something wrong with your calculation. Now, this particular aspirin tablet, I just looked at the bottle, uh, it actually expired in 2001. So it was probably made sometime in the, you know, late 90s, maybe 97, 98 or something. Um, so there's a good chance this aspirin bottle is older than uh, many of the students that are taking this class. Um, so the concentration might have dipped a little bit. It might not be as good as a uh, purchase aspirin. Okay. Anyhow, so that's all I will have to say with the pre-lab. Um, we're going to go next into the lab. And I hope you enjoy the experiment. One of the things I forgot to mention was why this was one of my favorite labs. And... If you actually look at the labs, you're going to see that there's no questions after the actual experiment. So you do have to fill out your data sheet, do your calculations, and do a graph, but there's no questions. And so that makes it a little bit easier for us to grade. Okay, so goodbye for now. So the first step in preparing our sample is we're going to take a couple of tablets of aspirin, uh, put them into this mortar and pestle, and get three in there. And I'm going to grind this up to a fine powder. And then I'm going to weigh a small amount for analysis. So I'm going to use a piece of weighing paper. And I'm going to tear the balance now. Let me check to see how much we're supposed to use. Um, it says between 0 0.075 and uh, 0 0.090. So let me put this on the weighing paper. Maybe I could have used a better. So go ahead and take a note of that mass measurement. You'll need it in the calculations. And then I have to add this to an Erlenmeyer flask. And the first step in the preparation is to uh, hydrolyze it. So I'm going to add some sodium hydroxide and put it on the hot plate for about 10 minutes, well, five to 10 minutes. So let's set it around five or six, uh, and then I'll keep an eye on that, right? And then we'll work out the rest of this a little bit later. So now we're going to do the last step of the preparation. Uh, so I'm gonna turn off the heat, and this is our solution that has the uh, ground up aspirin with the sodium hydroxide. Okay, and I'm going to transfer it into 
this 250 mil flask. Okay, now there might be a little bit of uh, material solution that didn't get transferred, so I'm going to rinse the Erlenmeyer flask out a couple of times and combine that. So the reason I'm rinsing this is to make sure that we get quantitative transfer of all of the ground up aspirin and the reaction product of it into this uh, 250 mile mil uh, volumetric flask. Okay, so let me rinse the funnel one more time. And now I'm going to bring this up to volume. So I'll pour the purified water into here close to the mark. And then I'll use a disposable pipette to get this right there. Okay, um, so I've filled it to the 250 mil mark, and the next thing I'm going to do is uh, uh, mix up the homogenize it. <laughs> so it's always a good practice to uh, mix this several times to make sure it's homogenous. Okay. And then I'm going to take a portion of this and I'm going to pipette uh, three milliliters of this solution into a 25 mil flask. So I've got a clean beaker now. And I've got a one mil pipette, so I'm going to give it three shots uh, from this pipette. And then the last part is to react the hydrolyzed aspirin with some iron chloride. Uh, so I'm going to pour the iron chloride into here now. And this should form a nice purple complex. So this is the sample now that's going to be ready for analysis. Okay. All right, so this is the preparation of the standards. Um, so we're using 0 0.00280 molar ASA. And you're going to need that value in a calculation. And so I'm going to put some into this clean vial. And then I'm going to pipette that into each of three volumetric uh, flasks. So each of these volumetric flasks uh, contain 25 mils. So um, To flask number one, I'm putting one ml in. To flask number two, I'm going to give it two shots, so it'll get a total of two mLs. And then the third flask, I'm going to put five mLs of the standard in. And now each of these, I'm going to dilute to the mark with the iron chloride solution. Okay, so what we're seeing now is the hydrolyzed aspirin, or ASA, uh, reacting with the iron-3 reagent to develop the colored uh, transition metal complex. And since we used uh, 1 ml for the first one, uh, 2 mLs for the second one, mm -hmm. and 5 mLs uh, for the third one, you can see that the color develops uh, to become more intense uh, with, the, you know, as the concentration of the sample increases. Okay, so that's it for this part. All right, we're going to get the uh, spectrophotometer ready here, so we have it set to our correct wavelength, and uh, the right filter on. we are going to then set this transmittance to zero.
So let's make sure there's nothing in there, okay? That hasn't happened before. Okay, then we come over here to our laptop and we're gonna look at calibrating our machine. So with our, requires a connection to the interface, it's not set up, so. All right, now that the power is plugged in, I'm gonna calibrate it. And with our transmittance set at zero with nothing in it, we're gonna set that to zero value and keep. And then we're gonna come back over here and put a blank in, which is the 0 0.02 molar iron chloride. And then we're gonna adjust this with the same knob to 100%. all the way up. Back over here and set that to 1 as in 100%. Okay, and you see our absorbance goes down to zero. So that's our baseline if there's no ASA in the solution. So we've calibrated, we'll go back to our regular samples. So now I'm going to run my three standards um, which we'll use to get our Beer's Law plot and then I'll run the sample as well. Uh, so I've taken a little portion of each and transferred them into the cuvettes. Uh, so this is the 1 to 25 dilution sample. And so I'm going to collect the data on that. Or it's probably Command K. There you go. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to enter the first concentration. And you see it auto-populates there. Okay, and then this is the second sample, which was the two mil um, to five mil, or to 20, 25 mil dilution. Just hit Command K. Oh, Command K? Command K. And then this is the five mil to 25 mil dilution sample. Okay, and then I hit stop. Analyze. And then analyze, and what we're gonna do is for the linear fit. Okay, and this gives you an equation. It basically gives you the M and B value for the equation Y is equal to MX plus B. Uh, so in this case, Y is our um, absorbance and X is the concentration. And now we're going to run the sample. So the sample, we're not actually going to use the graph, but we're just going to put the actual sample in and measure its absorbance uh, on the spec 20. Okay, and so this value you need to record in your notebook as the absorbance of the sample. Okay, and that's it for the data collection.